And now we're going to switch to our English. Everybody stay, understands English? No? Nobody? This is going to be a great lecture then. Što god radi, samo aplauz. Što god napravi, znaš. Sve će biti okay. So we're going to... We're going to switch our uh, communicators to English now. Blip, blip, blip. Everybody understands. Good. Uh, please give a warm welcome to our Irish friend with his uh, presentation, David versus Goliath. Give a big hand for Mr. David McWilliams. Dobro jutro. Puro hvala, Ivan. Prosite moje hrvatski je slabo. But I did try to... Oh, thank you. I will, I will talk about the significance of Muhammad Ali and all that carry on in a minute, but uh, I would uh, like to thank Aaron for inviting me uh, here. I made the fatal mistake of buying a kuchu on one of your otoks uh, <laughs> about Desert Godna ago. And uh, Irish people are usually quite self-confident and we tend to be quite good talkers. But when you go to Dalmatia, you suddenly feel very insecure. You feel very small, and very pink, and we're naturally not a nation that brags so much, so it's very strange for me to come here and tell you what Ireland did and how you could do it, etc., etc. But in Dalmatia, this is not the case. It is absolutely existentially important to tell everybody how good you are at everything. And it took us, our family, quite some time to get used to Dalmatia, um, not least because we found the people unbelievably able to both love and hate at the same time. <laughs> and that's very confusing for adults, let alone children. And I remember our first uh, real exposure to Dalmatia. We bought the house, which was a rather <laughs> bizarre uh, story. And... Uh, being typical Northern Europeans, because we are Irish, we, we, we're kind of stuck up in the North Atlantic and we're a bit like kind of ugly Italians up there, you know, we're, we're, we shouldn't really be there, but we have some sort of British traits in us. And uh, my wife found a big piece of marble, big, big piece of marble that the last people had left in the house. And she, being a good Protestant, uh, which there's very few in Ireland, and we keep them in a little cage in the zoo, and sometimes we're very nice to them. But she, uh, she said, well, we should get legs and make a table. So I said, fine. So I decided on the first or second day to go down to the village, into uh, a local bar, and ask whether or not there was a Kovac in the place. And uh, they said, no, no, no Kovac. No. I said, okay. They said, but, but these guys, they can, they can make this thing for you. I said, okay. I said, how much will it cost? And the guy looked at me, and you could see the calculation. He said, is it uh, about 1,200 euro? <laughs> I said, oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, let's, let's see. You know, maybe we've been fools in the first time. That's a good idea. So they came to the house, and they said, okay. And this is where I learned the expression sutra. <laughs> so sutra arrived. And uh, the Irish sat at one side of a table, which was about to be built by the Dalmatians. Each one was called Tome, by the way. <laughs> and there was Mali Tome and Veliki Tome, but they were all Tomes. And they arrived and they just looked at me and they smoked. I said, Pivo, this is Moja. I said, Yosh, you had no Pivo, Moja. Yosh, Dva, Moja. And this went on. And uh, we were perplexed. Needless to say, two months later, no work was done. <laughs> Despite the extortionate price of 1,200 euros being waved in front of Tome's face, every day it was tu vruce. <laughs> oh, puno vruce, puno vruce. I said, you fucking think it's vruce? What about us? We're from up the north. This is your place. And then they'd say things to me like, oh, you go. <laughs> Please. So, 
you can imagine that our assimilation into Croatia has been beautiful, exotic, charming, fantastic, and deeply frustrating on all levels. But it has been wonderful. We, our, our children, we've kind of fallen in love with Croatia for all the right reasons. And uh, I suppose this is the reason I, I'm here uh, today, because it's, it's a country that really reminds me of Ireland. You've the same sort of mad complexes as we have and all the issues, and all the issues with your neighbors, and all that good stuff, and lots of Catholicism thrown in, all the mad stuff, you know? But it is a place that I believe is underachieving, profoundly, as an economy. Underachieving in a way in which is difficult to understand unless you spend time here. And then you can see one thing which is really crucial. There is nothing going on in a country like Ireland that couldn't go on in a country like Croatia. There is nothing idiosyncratic which excludes Croatia from the type of prosperity that countries like Ireland have achieved. And that is a very important message, because sometimes when I'm sitting, usually Posle Ruchak, and discussing these things, there's a, a Croatian way that sometimes people feel, oh, we can't do that. But that's not true. And that brings me to our friend Muhammad Ali. This rumble in the jungle, it was a video I saw quite recently, and it was an extraordinary thing, not least because Muhammad Ali had no hope. George Foreman was the heavyweight champion of the world. He was the fastest, he was the toughest, he was the hardest. So much so was he a favorite that the bookies refused to take any bets eight days before the game because everybody thought that Foreman would destroy Ali and on paper that was the case. Because Foreman had knocked out every single boxer that he had fought and he'd knocked them all out in the first four rounds. He had never gone more than four rounds. Ali was 33. Foreman was 23. In boxing that makes an enormous difference. Why? Because you're faster, you're younger, you can hit harder and you can take more punches. So everyone said Ali's going to turn up, he's going to act, do a bit of showmanship, and then he's going to go. But something weird happened. Ali's camp figured out something that maybe your man, foreman's strength, his power, was actually his weakness. And if Ali could just go more than four rounds with Foreman, maybe Foreman couldn't go more for, than four rounds because he was stupid. And because he might box himself out, he might hit Ali so hard that he'd punch himself out and he would get tired and then Ali could wait. But the question was, how could you sustain these boxes from this monster? And then Ali figured out something else. When the fight started, Ali walked into the ring, and rather than go head-to-head -head with Foreman, he did something very odd. He started to lie back on the ropes. The ropes are made of elastic in a boxing ring. And Ali and his coach figured out that if Ali lay on the ropes, the elasticity of the ropes would dissipate the power of Foreman's punches, and Ali would not get hurt. So he came out, and what did he do? He lay on the ropes for the first four rounds and he took a battering, but Foreman didn't hurt him. And then, gradually, but definitively, Foreman started to get tired and tired and tired. And then in the seventh round, as you see, Ali knocked him out. So how can you go from having no hope and being full of melancholy and self-doubt and self-analysis and all that mad Central European stuff you guys have around here, okay? To actually being a winner. That is the question. You need a plan, a strategy. And Ali had that plan. He had that strategy and he implemented it. And that is what all countries that are reasonably successful economic, economically have. They have a strategy. They say, okay, we're weak here, but maybe we're strong there. Maybe we're strong here, but we should hide that because you don't want to tell people about that. And you figure things out. And Croatia has so much going for it. Much more than Ireland. Much, much more. I mean, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I left university, 
I left university in the poorest country in Western Europe. My first job with a mathematics degree in economics and all that carry on, I was a dishwasher in New York City, illegal, with no papers, hanging out with Colombians and Latin Americans. Why? Because we were the Latinos of Europe. We had no prospects. And how come, 25 years later, my kids are born in the richest, are one of the richest countries in Western Europe? We had no technology 25 years ago. Right now, today, Ireland will export 72 billion euros worth of tech. 72 billion, that's bigger than the entire Croatian GDP, and they are just exports from one Irish sector. There are 130,000 high-tech graduates working in IT in Ireland. 130,000. There's 22,000 employed every year, new graduates, into IT. This is an enormous industry. But it's not unique to us. And you can do it. You should get your phone there. Do you, no, that's a very strange ringtone. Anyway, now, I'll tell you a story about ringtones, but we'll, go, we'll get sidetracked. Um, just put your phones off, because they can be very embarrassing in public. You know, those sort of guilty pleasure you download. Anyway, think about Croatia. What's Croatia surrounded by? And why can't Croatia expand an industry? And let's kind of look at Europe at the moment and do a wee bit of economics. I'm going to be very unfashionable. I'm going to say something which is not uh, something you hear in Greece very often today, which is I'm going to actually say I feel sorry for the Germans. Because the poor old Germans got into the Euro with the Italians and the Greeks and the Irish. It was like they went out for too many beers one night and they woke up and we were in bed with them. People who looked like me were in bed with them. And there was fellas like Stavros down the end of the bed. And I said, sorry Gunter, yeah, you did weird shit. You're in bed with us now, you're stuck. The problem with the poor old Germans is their plan was the following, which was that we would turn into little Germans once we took their currency. But you can quote that other great American economist, Mike Tyson, who said about plans that everybody has a plan until they get a punch in the face. And the punch in the face the poor Germans got was not only did we not turn into little Germans, but the Greeks became dementedly more Greek. The Spanish flamboyantly more Spanish. The Irish ridiculously more Irish. And we did all this using German money. And then when they came looking for their money back a few years ago, it was all gone. So they're stuck with us. So what do they have to do? What are they doing now? They have to make sure that we start spending again. But we've no money. So they have to start lending us money again. Because they've lots of money. But they don't want to tell their people that. So what do they do? They get an Italian to do their dirty work. Mario Draghi is a typical Italian, okay? And in a crisis, what do Italians do? They print money. They've been doing that for years. And they are trying to turn the euro, Mario Draghi and his Italian mates, into the lira behind the backs of the Germans. And the Germans have to put up with it. But the Germans now realize they have to be behind this. This is very important for Croatia because I hear you're thinking of joining the Euro sometime in the future. Don't. It's a very stupid move. If you want to build industry, do not do that. But the Germans realize that they have to get as many people in the Euro as possible so that they can export their stuff to us and we buy it. And if we don't have the money, they give it to us. So we end up in Ireland and Spain and Italy and Greece borrowing money from Germans to buy the stuff the Germans make in the first place, which is really good for the Germans, but it's not so good for us, and the Germans are behind this. And this is a serious, serious nation. They're not like us. These are serious people. <laughs> and this came back to me quite recently where my son, who uh, last year, this time last year, he's 12 now, he was 11, he went to Germany on his own for six months. 
which is a shocking thing, but sometimes you have to learn the language of the master at a young age. And he, but he went to Germany and, and, and we were really, we were traumatized, but, but it was okay because we took the German son. So it was like a hostage situation, you know? <laughs> he said, you know, you do anything with ours and your man gets it. It's an Irish version of ISIS, you know? But anyway, no, no, it was not very, oh, that bad taste, Jesus Christ. And the poor German kid that we took, his name was Herman. Now, you can imagine being Herman the German in Dublin, in school. You know? <laughs> but but my, my, my wife was very, very traumatized at our son going over to Germany, so she said, David, you be the man. You go over, be the man, be the big guy. You take Cal over to Germany, you know, and blah, 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 talk to him man to man, you know. I said, oh, okay, fine, 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 I'll do that. So I got the flight over from Dublin to Germany, and we head into the car, and we arrived in the German house. And if the Germans thought that the Irish were a ridiculously soft and sappy and inconsequential race, it was confirmed by the fact that not only did my son not cry at 11 years old, I wept openly in the German kitchen. Like a child, it just came out and I couldn't stop and I couldn't stop and I, and I cried and I cried. And I looked through glassy eyes at the German father who was looking at me as if I was some subhuman species. <laughs> and all I remember in the back of my head was thinking in his head, he was probably thinking, fuck, we lent money to these people? <laughs> and then about uh, four weeks later, I got a call from the German mum. Entschuldigung. I said, yes, hi, hi, wie geht's? I said, good, it's good. Yeah, 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 what's going on? And she said, oh, we have a small problem. Said, Your son has been suspended from gymnasium. I said, oh, for fuck's sake. So I got, on the, I got, I got Cal on the phone. I said, Cal, Cal, what did you do? You're, you're representing us in Ireland and la, 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 la. I said, he said, dad, 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 calm down, calm down, dad, calm down. He said, you know these germs? I said, yeah, yeah, you know these germs? They're really, really different. I said, why? He says, because, you know, when they give a warning, they really mean it. <laughs> there is the difference. There's the difference. So these are serious people. They're going to print money, loads and loads and loads of money, and that has ramifications for you. Massive ramifications for you. But they're going to print money. Why? Because they realize that they have to keep the euro going. And they were also, in the last 24 months, disabused of a notion which they had, which was for the last 40 years, France has pretended to the world economically, that it is a little Germany. It's not. It's a big Italy. <laughs> and Germany has to pay. Now, what does that mean for Croatia? It means your currency, the currency, the euro, is going to go through lots and lots of convulsions. And you're better off staying out. The first being, of course, the Greeks. Our friends in the south, Stavros and his mates, their problem is not that they defaulted, but that they didn't default enough. And they will have to default again. And nobody's going to care at the moment. The Germans and the French and the Italians, they're all saying, can't do that, Stavros. And Stavros is saying, yeah, whatever. And the interesting thing is financial markets will not care. Once Greece defaults again, their crisis will begin to be over. And this is the big myth you read about in the papers, that financial markets have got some morality and some memory and all that stuff. So they don't. The Greek balance sheet is broken, as is the Croatian one. And a broken balance sheet is made better by less debt, not more debt. So it's a matter of what you do. And all the shouting and roaring in Brussels right now, today and for the next month, will mean nothing. Because financial markets and those people who lend investment banks and the banks, they always come back. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I going to Iceland to do a documentary. And uh, at the time, Iceland had defaulted, devalued, done everything. All the wrong way. And all the Financial Times, the New York Times, blah, blah, blah. Handelsblatt, all that. So Deutsche Zeitung, we're all saying, the Icelandics are a disaster. And look, they, have, they haven't paid their money back, and etc., etc. It's awful. And they will pay. 
And I got the flight uh, out to Iceland, which is very, very nice, actually. The, the flight up over Scotland. If you ever want to do it, it's really nice. Nice day and out into the Atlantic and away, away you go to Iceland. And I expected to see Armageddon. But something really struck me, that nobody in Iceland was phased by the fact that they had defaulted and devalued and everything. Life went on. And the only people who were worried in Iceland were English bankers in the hotel in Reykjavik looking for their money back. And they were very, 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 very sad looking people. And I put this to the Icelandic finance minister. And he said, but we have no money. It's all gone. We can give them fish if they like. <laughs> now this is an important point because it means he defined his reality he didn't make up a make-believe world that, you know, we can do this easily. He said, look, we have no money. We're a little island in the Atlantic. We're surrounded by fish. In fact, giving them fish would have been more profitable than giving them euros. Because the price of fish has gone up and the price of euros has gone down. So technically he was right. But my point is that we will get serious defaults in the euro in the next few years. And therefore, Croatia should stay out of the euro. You don't want to join a messy club. It's very simple. And you need, from where I'm standing, on the otok of Zlaren, to devalue your currency because the country is too expensive. Far too expensive. And if you want to build an industry, you cannot build an industry when you're expensive. You have to start cheap. Every single country that wants to build a tech industry or any industry has to have a competitive advantage and Croatia is too expensive and it's not productive enough for that level of expense. And this is a big deal. And the problem with your government is they're like our government. They're obsessed with respectability. It happens when you're a colony, guys. It's all right, we've been colonies. And when you've been ruled by others, you crave bourgeois respectability. And there's nothing more respectable than being in the rich man's club. But that doesn't make you rich. Respectability is the fastest way to poverty and being a second-class European citizen. So the first thing I would say to you is how you build these industries. We built it during a period of our own currency. And we devalued to make ourselves cheap. The second thing you should do to try and build a type of industry and this list is not exhaustive, it's not prescriptive, it's just observational. Second thing you've got to do is figure out how much power Croatia has over yourself. Over yourselves, when I'm reading the very informative Slobodan or Slobodno Dalmatia, which is a fantastic read, I believe it's very good on Nogomed, but not very good on anything else. But <laughs> and Nogomed clearly is important. And you have beaten Ireland every time we play. And we will never forgive you for that. It's very deep inside us. And when we looked as if we were going to draw with you in 1996 to get into the European Championship, we played you in Zagreb. And you might remember how many minutes the local referee added on at the end. Eleven. <laughs> and Davor Shuker scored at ten minutes and twenty seconds on the clock. And surprise, surprise, the referee said, Gotovo. <laughs> so we remember this. Don't forget it. But, come back. Last year I was talking, and this is an interesting way of looking at how Croatia and Ireland, but well, Croatia in this context is affected by the world and how little power we have. I was sitting uh, in a bar called Aldura in uh, Zlaren with one of the many Tomes, and uh, <laughs> talking about Galebs or More or Lubav or all the usual shit, right? Or Ribi. How can they talk about fish all the time? It's amazing. It gets in my head. Anyway, and he was saying to me that he was uh, converting a house in Zlaren and he was going to borrow in Swiss francs. Mm, says I. Interesting. He said, what do you think? I said, do what you want. I'm not your financial advisor. You know? Just buy me another beer and fine. But, and he said, you know, if I borrow in Swiss francs, the interest rate's going to be very low, maybe close to zero. I said, yeah, but, you know, you're not Swiss. It's a small little technicality, but, you know, think about it. You're not Swiss. Last time I checked, you lived in Zibinik, which is not Geneva. It's better fun than Geneva, but it's not Geneva. 
So just think about this character who will remain nameless. Dragon. No, no. Uh, <laughs> so he borrows the Swiss francs to build a house in Zlaren, and everything's good. And this time last year, everything looks hunky hunky dory. And then President Obama decides to make peace with Iran because he wants legacy issues. He wants to be seen as a good guy, making peace with Cuba, Iran, all this. And he makes peace with Iran. But who doesn't like the American making peace with Iran? Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for a while, and they, they're getting very fed up because the, the, Sun, the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia don't like the Shias, la, 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 la. And then eventually they say, okay, screw you, America. If you get closer to Iran, we'll drop the price of oil. Why? Because we can produce at $22 a barrel, and you cannot, and nor can the Iranians. So they drop the price of oil. Where does the price of oil affect first? Russia. Why? Because the Russians are a big, big nuclear power on top of an oil well. Okay, the ruble collapses because the oil price is falling. What happens to Russian money? It leaves Russia and goes into Switzerland in enormous quantities. Too much for the Swiss, and eventually the Swiss have to abandon the currency cap that they had, and suddenly Drago in Shibenik is facing a 20% increase in the amount of kunas he has to spend to pay his mortgage on Zlaren. That shows you how unbelievably exposed you are, and why you should never, ever, ever give in to European harmonization of your taxes, because if you don't use your taxes to attract an industry and give them zero tax, you won't get them. So you have to keep your taxes, because this is one of the very few things you can control. And the final point I will make, so stay out of the euro, keep your tax policy, and give tax holidays to foreign companies. That's what we did. It's essential when you have no money, you have to do unnatural acts to attract it. The last thing is more of an observation about Croatian children. Uh, my children are certified ju juvenile delinquents, it's unfortunate. I have, I have a, a daughter who's 14, and I'm trying to explain to her that looking like a Ukrainian hooker is not a good look. Do you get that? Yeah, okay. And, and in Zlaren, our kids are Irish kids, okay? And of course, they talk to the Croat kids. And we have these conversations, a prostate or susities, what we do talk about you behind your back, but we have these conversations about the inherent academic bias in Croatian education. Our children are total free spirits. School is not about academics in Ireland. Academics is not central to the way in which we bring our children up. What I've really noticed in Croatia is the young kids of 14, 15 are terrified by this getting notes. Is, is five good or is five bad? Good. Okay, so they're all obsessed by being, having five. And my kids are like, what the fuck is that all about? <laughs> That's like chemistry and stuff, right? I look at Croatian kids and I see your education system destroying them. It's hyper-academic, it's creating robots. You've got to create kids that can think for themselves and can go out to the big bad world and do deals and realize that academics isn't everything. And you have to foster creative people and allow them to breathe weirdos, oddballs, Strange kids, dyslexic kids, kids who can't read, all these sort of things who get elbowed out in the Croatian system. I can really see it amongst the children. And creative people come in the strangest guises, but what they do all do is they generate unbelievable amounts of enterprise. Unbelievable amounts of enterprise. And academic children do not create enterprise. And I will finish in a town called Pula. Ireland's most creative genius is a writer called James Joyce. Well, Ra's a writer, unless, of course, he's been embalmed and the Kremlin is still... Anyway. But James Joyce lived in Pula for many, many years. And James Joyce was constantly looking for money from his father, Stanislaus Joyce, who was an amazingly witty man. If you ever read anything about James Joyce, his father is a fantastic 
link, I suspect, from father to son and onto the page. But James Joyce destroyed the English language and then recreated it in Ulysses. He was the ultimate modernist. But in 1908, his dad got fed up with getting these letters from James from Pula to say, send me money, which is what all Irish sons, that's what we share with Dalmatian sons, actually. <laughs> we love our mothers. Our wives are never good enough for our mothers, are them. They don't cook enough, they don't clean enough, just okay with the same thing. So James's mum says to James's dad, you better figure out what little Jimmy boy is doing over there in Pula. Send over Eva, the sister. So the sister goes over to Pula and she finds James in the cinema. He's in the cinema in 1908, all day. There were three cinemas in Pula in 1908, and James Joyce would sit in the cinemas, like this Kino here, and just watch the movies, because it was this new form of communication, and he was obsessed by it, and it also allowed him to do no work, which is very important. And Eva said to James, you're really obsessed by these cinemas, aren't you, Jimmy? And he goes, yeah, I am. This is, this is the future. This is like the Facebook of its time, the Twitter of its time, okay? Right? And she says, Jesus, James, do you know what? How many people live in Pula? And you know at the time there's 18,000 people living there. So not a lot of people. Three cinemas. And she said, I know a city with half a million people with no cinema. I know another one with 300,000 people with no cinema. Another one with 200,000. That is one million people living in three cities with no cinema. This is the best investment opportunity ever. She was talking about Dublin, Belfast, and Cork. There were no cinemas in Ireland. And James Joyce, the amazingly creative writer that we know about, but who had a brain like a writer, so he wanted to do things for himself. He wanted to think about the world. He didn't want insurance. He didn't want a wage. He wanted to create stuff. He said, we will go and we will set up cinemas in Ireland. And James Joyce was financed by local Italians and Croats. Think about this, to go to Ireland and set up the first cinema ever in Ireland in 1909, financed with Croat money, which is A, emblematic of how much richer you were than us, and B, and this is the important thing about children, it is significant that the type of mind, the type of mind that could write Ulysses, was also the type of mind that wanted to set up business. Because the creative artist and the entrepreneur are exactly the same type of people. They don't want rules and regulations. They want to express themselves. They want to think for themselves. And they want to take risk. It is incredibly risky to write a novel. It is incredibly risky to write a modern novel and be at the vanguard of a movement, and it's also incredibly risky to set up a business. But these are the types of people we need. And it starts in the education system. It starts in the education system. It starts by liberating the minds of your children from the tyranny of academia. And I believe that in Croatia, there is a snobbery and a hierarchy associated with academia, which is, for me, rather quaint and old-fashioned, but it's actually not good for you. So finally, don't join the Euro, hold on to your own taxes, and begin the process of trying to explain to your children that in an interlinked, globalized world, where Drago in Shibenik is impacted by things the King of Saudi Arabia does, and where you are constantly traveling and trading with the world, you need to be open. And then you have to ask yourself, does Croatia have a strategy that is credible, that is believable, and that can get the most out of your people? And there's nothing going on in this country that suggests you cannot do this. So the question you have to ask yourselves is, are you, is your company, and is Croatia, when you look at yourself in the context of the rumble in the jungle, 
Are you foreman, the favorite who doesn't change and loses? Or are you Ali, the outsider, the underdog that takes risks and wins? Thank you very much. We'll be right back.